This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Welcome to Somewhere in the Skies, and today we have a very special interview with one of the most controversial people in the UFO field, community, whatever you want to call it, and controversial for all the right reasons, which we will definitely talk about. So we have a ton of listener questions for him, and I have a bunch of my own, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I am going to welcome Mick West. Mick, how are you? I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm doing good. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I can't believe we haven't made it happen earlier, but I'm happy we're doing it now because you and I were talking off air. Um, it seems that kind of the UFO fervor has died down lately. And maybe that was to be expected after this uh, report came out. But yeah, how do you feel about what's going on right now in terms of that? Yeah, it has died down, and it's interesting. I was I was looking a, a while ago at the Google trend uh, for searches for the, for UFO, and it actually peaked a little bit before the report came out with the uh, the media coverage uh, with sixty minutes in particular uh, right. was was like the kind of high point. And the report itself, I think, perhaps let people down, and it wasn't quite as exciting as people were anticipating. And when it did actually come out. Yeah, it's it's not a nothing burger, but it's it's not the kind of like the big reveal that everybody was hoping for. So I think there's a little bit of kind of a rebound effect from the anticipation and then the the, the, the letdown, and people are kind of recalibrating their expectations, and a lot of people are just I think kind of lost interest. You know, the people who are kind of like the people who were brought in by the media attention, and they thought that there was something like amazing about to happen, and then it, it didn't, and. Uh, we're moving on. Wait, that's, that doesn't really mean any interesting new videos for me to look at either. So <laughs> I've got right. kind of losing interest in myself. Yeah, I know I sent you a couple of videos a few weeks ago, I think it was, from out in Hawaii, which is a case I'm still working on. But um, I got to thank you for taking a look at those. And hopefully I can share them with the public soon because um, I got your opinion and a few others as well. Um, and uh, that'll be interesting. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. Um you know, that anticipation and that expectation that a lot of the people in the UFO field, um, I guess, crave or kind of um, feed off of. And uh, then there's the stark reality to the topic, to the issue, to the way the government is looking at it. Um, so you did mention the UAP report had a little bit of interesting things in there. Would you mind maybe touching on what you personally found of any interest or compelling about it? Well, for me personally, uh, there was kind of a funny thing that was interesting, which was that the first um, explanation that they listed, you know, they, they categorized things into five possible explanations for these these UAPs. The first one was birds and balloons and other <laughs> airborne clutter like drones and things. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of funny because people have been mocking me for suggesting things like balloons. Uh, right. and, and even birds, uh, it's become like a bit of a meme that you know, everything is a bird or a balloon. And then along comes the Navy and they're, they're like, uh, yeah, a lot of this is airborne clutter and things like, like birds, balloons and drones. And I just went, yes, when that, uh, <laughs> that happened. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, the, the, the interesting things are that there are cases that they haven't been able to identify that seem to display uh, unusual movements, yeah, unusual aer aerodynamic behavior. And they list a couple of things like uh, you know, very high velocity and very high accelerations. Now those things, if, if they're actually uh, craft in the sky that are doing that would be very interesting. And uh, I would be very interested to see what that data actually was excuse me, that led them to that conclusion that the, these things you know, might actually exist. But you know, within the report itself, they go on to say, or actually they start out saying that these things might be sensor error or they might be observer misperception. Now, mm -hmm. uh, then you've got this kind of interesting way, like the, the report kind of divides things, up into, divides things up into different categories. And then it divides them up into different categories in other ways. And you, you can't tell which way these categories overlap 
So they will say things like uh, a, a lot of these sensors, a lot of these things were physical objects because they were picked up by more than one sensor. Mm -hmm. And then they say things like uh, some of these objects uh, displayed unusual aerodynamic behavior, aerodynamic behavior. But we don't know if the ones that displayed unusual aerodynamic behavior were the same ones that were picked up on multiple sensors. Because that's that for me would be the the interesting thing. If you could actually pick up something that's displaying unusual aerodynamic behavior on multiple sensors, and that behavior is detected on multiple sensors, like you've got a video of something that looks like it's moving really fast, and then you've also got radar data that shows that thing moving really fast at the same time and the same location, and it's, it's irrefutably the same object, that would be really interesting for me. But we don't know if that actually happened. Right. Yeah. That triangulation of data from different, like you mentioned, whether sensors, angles, radar, whatnot, um, is essential. And you're right. I think, you know, the the one word we can say about this assessment, preliminary assessment, apparently, is that it is ambiguous. And, you know, for a good reason, I think that leaves them off the hook for a lot of things as well. But that leads to issues in itself, which I do want to talk to you about a little bit later in terms of... Um, you know, what that ambiguity does to the public in terms of the world we live in today with conspiracy theory. Um, but I am getting ahead of myself, Mick. Um, for any of my listeners or viewers who don't know the Mick West origin story, you know, the comic book <laughs> uh, bitten by the spider sort of thing. Um, how did you get involved with all this? I know you've talked about it a bunch, but um, how do you get involved with this? Interested in UFOs? How did you eventually... Yeah create um, metabug yeah if you don't mind giving us the uh sure sure. Notes version. My, sure my potted history well um you see back there i have a skateboard which is a, a tony hawk skateboard that, that was given to me when we finished the first tony hawk pro skater video game i was one of the programmers uh on that i was one of the co-founders of neversoft and uh, so that's my my background is that i used to be a video game programmer and uh after you know we we were fairly successful with with doing the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series, uh, I kind of took e early retirement from the video game industry and just started doing things that I found interesting. And something I've always been interested in is um, you know, essentially like things like pseudoscience, things where people are making claims that are things like perhaps the supernatural, perhaps things like UFOs and things like conspiracy theories, and then investigating those things. And that's just something I was interested in as a young person, uh, back you know in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, and didn't get much time to indulge that whilst I was working, and kind of when I I, I went into semi-retirement, I just started looking at these types of things. I got interested in in looking at the uh, the chemtrails conspiracy theory, which is the conspiracy theory that the government is spraying stuff from the backs of airplanes, and that's why we see these long white trails behind them. And I did a blog about that. That that's evolved into another site called Metabunk, which is just about discussing all kinds of things like conspiracy theories and pseudoscience and investigating sightings in the sky. And I did that for a while, and I wrote a book, which as you can see on the shelf there, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, which is about how to talk to people who are kind of trapped in conspiracy theory uh, thinking and how to help them out of it. And yeah, over the last few years, because of, like, because of my interest in things like chemtrails, I got quite good at uh, identifying airplanes and identifying like what something is in the sky. And uh, it's just kind of a skill that I developed over time. And that naturally lent itself to UFOs. And I was never really a, a UFO guy until maybe like you know, maybe three or four years ago, about the end of 2017. I would occasionally look at them. But then I got interested in... First of all, this Chilean Navy case, which was a kind of a similar case to the, the US Navy cases where they, they had this video of a strange object and I helped figure out what this object actually was. And then these these newer cases came along and they, they were, were very interesting. You know, the US Navy cases, the the gimbal, the go fast and the, the Nimitz encounter, the Tic Tac. And they, they were getting a lot of attention and you've got these interesting little videos that you can you can analyze. And I've always been someone who's been really interested in taking a video or taking a photo and then trying to figure out what it actually shows. So I, I use my 
the three D uh, geometry skills that I, I learned uh, while doing video game programming. Because you have you have to take uh, with video game programming, you have to be able to do the transforms to turn 3D into 2D, and it's just the opposite type of thing when you're turning a 2D image into a 3D image. Uh, Try to figure out where things are in space. So I just got really interested in doing that, and it's just kind of grown over the years. Uh, I think, in a way, it kind of sucked me in because I am very interested in analyzing these videos, and so I became a little bit well known as you know the guy who looked at the videos and came up with his alternative explanations, which you know, I did do along with other people. And then people asked me questions about other things, and I yeah you know, I, I initially I'm going to say I'm not really that interested. I'm not really a UFO guy. I'm a video analyst guy, but you know people keep asking, and so I come up with answers and I. I then start talking about the broader issues like you know, are UFOs aliens and things like that, and I give my opinions there, and it's just kind of uh, you know it's just become this little interesting hobby. Although, like like I say, like you said at the start, is starting to die down. So I'm actually starting to kind of <laughs> um, wean myself off UFOs to a degree and get it back to the stuff I used to do on Metabunk, which is looking into conspiracy theories. So here we I was going to ask what comes next, you know, when UFOs go on the shelf, because this happens in the UFO field. Yeah. Like this topic goes, you know, kind of explodes into the mainstream when like a big seminal case happens or maybe a mass UFO sighting or, you know, a soundbite in the New York Times or whatnot. And then it kind of goes away. And I think, you know, this is the longest, I would say, prolonged amount of time UFOs have sort of been in the mainstream for almost two years now. I mean, it's just grown exponentially in terms of those interested in it and becoming members of the quote unquote community. But um, yeah, what, what, what sort of are you looking at now um, since we're kind of, you know, taking a little breather with UFOs? Well, uh, I think the good news is that uh, people are always going to see strange things in the sky. Right. Uh, just, just because of the nature of things. Uh, you know, if, if there were no aliens and there was no magic technology, let's you know, assume there isn't for a second, people are still going to see things in the sky that they don't understand and, and they need explaining or investigating or possible things hypothesized. So that, that area is still going to remain. Uh, but the, these, these big stories about UFOs seem to have kind of been uh, you know, pushed back or just not pushed back, really, I guess died away. Uh, because nothing new has come along. You know, we had before this drip, drip, drip of uh, of, of new videos being released, uh, but that hasn't happened for a while. So maybe it, it would ramp up. But you know, if I'm not looking at UFOs, uh, which you know, I, I will still look at them, I, I, I look at um, conspiracy theories. And right now, there's a whole bunch of very significant conspiracy theories that I almost feel bad that I spent time looking at UFOs because there are these, these other issues that are out there. I mean, one in particular is uh, the anti-vaccine conspiracy theory. People thinking that there is some kind of conspiracy by big pharma to push vaccines even though they don't work and they're dangerous. And then some people go even more extreme than that and they think that you know the vaccines are uh, uh, deliberately toxic or that they have little microchips in them or, or something like that, so, or that the coronavirus is a hoax. So I think those are very important um, issues to address. Before I was doing um, UFOs this year, I was very into looking at the uh, election conspiracy fraud type cons uh, election election fraud uh, voter fraud like conspiracy theories there was lots of people thinking that uh, the election was stolen by by Biden and that Trump actually legit legitimately won but yeah obviously yeah, from my perspective he didn't and I think it's very important to kind of help people see what the real facts are in that case as well because I think that's something that's very destructive to you know the the very fabric of our country if we have this very polarized beliefs um and it's interesting the the older conspiracy theories like chemtrails and 9 11 and uh you know things that have been around for a long time that i used to think were like you know, this is what a conspiracy theory is they've almost faded away to nothing when you compare them to these these newer conspiracy theories like QAnon. Uh, the the anti-vaccine stuff, the the voter fraud stuff, it's all kind of melded together into one kind of huge meta conspiracy where the deep state is trying to impose some kind of communist uh, rule over the world, and things like 
like uh, like chemtrails and 9-11 and and even the ufo thing which is you know obviously been a conspiracy theory to some degree for for a long time i've i've been you know they they, they don't seem very big or important anymore that's a good point. You know, I, I feel like there was when I first got involved with the UFO topic, I was 13 and, you know, I was on AOL in the chat rooms and the mm. forums, Paranet, all that stuff. And it just seemed so innocent back then, you know, who shot JFK or, you know, stuff like that. And you're right. And, you know, I've got this conspiracy board in my background as kind of a, I, I not, I guess, a parody of that whole idea of connecting everything together and you're right QAnon has become this like amalgamation of everything and it's become like you said real and dangerous you look at the riots or excuse me you know what happened at the yeah. um you know at the uh, at congress and everything or the capitol excuse me and it's become real and it's become dangerous and i i'd love to get your thoughts on that um you know the danger of conspiracy theory other than just you know an insurrection like these things have drastic consequences for everybody you know yeah very much so and i think you know the most immediate consequence that you can see with conspiracy theories is, is when it comes to health uh, a lot of people are very suspicious of of conventional health care and so they they seek out other uh, forms of health care like people don't get the vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine, uh, largely because of disinformation that they've read. They they read things like that uh, more people die because of the vaccine than than die of coronavirus, and they believe these things because they kind of resonate with something uh, in the in their in their minds because they've become kind of accustomed to distrusting government. And even if you make very extreme case, uh, very extreme statements like like that, you know, claiming that more people die of the vaccine, you know, this is people saying, you know, I got injected with the vaccine, and you know, you know that somebody died because they were injected of, with the vaccine. It, it's kind of a ridiculous statement, but people believe it because if you've if you started to believe things like, um, you know, in in the olden days, like like the like nine eleven being a, an inside job, if you can believe the government could actually do that. Then it's a very short step. You know, it's almost like not, not a step at all to believe that the government would be uh, covering up some kind of uh, huge, I don't know, population control experiment or something like that, or uh, some kind of uh, you know they want to usher us all into COVID camps type thing. Uh, and and then obviously you're not going to get this vaccine because you you think that the government is trying to poison you, and you end up yes, you know, a bunch of these people. Uh, you've seen like some of the more ardent opponents of the vaccine, the conspiracy theorists, are getting COVID and dying. And probably most of them would have been fine had they got the vaccine. So it, it's, it's, it's not just harmful, it's killing people. People are dying. And if you take that, not just on those individual stories, you look at the, the entire country and you know, the entire world, and you think how many people have been affected by this this belief that vaccines are harmful, this conspiracy right. theory essentially, because it, it would have to be a conspiracy to, to cover up, you know, this thing. Fauci would have to be in on it. You know, the the president would have to be in it. Even Trump would have to be in it because he's he says you should take the vaccine now. Uh, it the the effect of that is going to be maybe something like tens or a hundred thousand deaths because of essentially a conspiracy theory and not just you know old people who are going to die in a few years anyway which you know is, i wouldn't say is a good thing because i don't want my elderly relatives to die years earlier than they should but younger people as well you know people in the in their 50s and people in their 40s and even even like teenagers um mm -hmm. they're getting affected by conspiracy theories and they're dying or they're becoming very ill i mean coronavirus has effects that last uh you know the still still you got this long covid thing where people have breathing issues or they have brain fog uh, that lasts for a long time and these are very very real effects of conspiracy theories and then of course you've got the broader distrust of government and then people storming the capital which uh, and the breakdown of of civil society and the polarization of people into into groups where they they shout at each other rather than talk with each other and uh, uh, and that's 
part of the reason why I do what I do is that I, I see these harmful effects of conspiracy theories. And I think the more that can be done to lead people away from disinformation and lead them towards good information, the, the better, uh, because you know, these, these harms are real and we should do something about them. Right. And, you know, I want to connect that to the UFO conspiracy in just a sec, Mick. But um, I'd love to ask you this. When you first got involved in debunking and, um, you know, trying to sort of stamp down these things before they spin off their access and out of control, did you ever see where we are right now happening, where conspiracy theory would become this big? A world leader would not only um, promote some of these, but go on to you know, inevitably cause a lot of damage in this country and yeah. other countries. There's conspiracies going not. on right now yeah. with Biden too. But um, sure. yeah. yeah, did you ever foresee any of this? No, I, I kind of thought it would stay as it was and that these conspiracy theories would be a fringe that was embraced by, you know, five to 10% of the population and perhaps more mainstream conspiracy theories like who shot JFK would, would have more of an adherence. But yeah, I think what happened was very surprising to me. It's something that always happens to me with conspiracy theories is the first time I hear about them, I think, oh, that's ridiculous. No one could ever believe that. And then I see more people talking about it. And I guess, ah, oh, it's, you know, it's just this, it's not going to, nothing, nothing much will come of it. And it's just so ridiculous. I'm not going to allow people to talk about it on, on, on the forum. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the way 9-11 started for me. Even though that's a mainstream conspiracy theory, uh, I was into chemtrails at the time. And I thought, yeah, this 9-11 stuff is just nonsense. I don't want to talk about that. But eventually I did. And then I started Metabunk. And then people started bringing up Flat Earth. And I thought, that's just so insanely ridiculous. I'm not going to allow any discussion of, of flat earth on Metabunk. And of course, now I have a, a huge flat earth sub forum on there because <laughs> people kept talking about it. And, and then QAnon comes along and it's this ridiculous story about how there's a secret person in government who's leaking information to an army of uh, Anons via HCHAN, which made no sense whatsoever. And it, was, it just seemed you know, obviously ridiculous you know, kind of a, an extension of Pizzagate, which was also ridiculous. And so I, I wasn't really paying it much attention. And then it became the biggest and most consequential conspiracy theory in, in modern times. It, yeah. uh, it really took off way beyond my expectation. So no, I did not expect it. Um, it's unbelievable. It really is. Well, I mean, zooming in on the UFO thing, um, what do you find most dangerous within the ufo circle when it comes to conspiracy theory it's it's not i've always said ufoology and the ufo conspiracy theory is mostly harmless uh because it's it's not you know it's not like you believe in ufos and you're you, you know whatever whatever you you start thinking that the government is trying to poison you uh but i do think that if you were a believer in the UFO conspiracy theory, uh, which would be that the government is covering up knowledge of UFOs, it kind of leads to a distrust of the government. Because if you look at you know the history of, of UFOs, uh, it really the, the modern era of UFOs dates back to 1947, uh, 1948. Yeah, 1947 was the first flying saucer incident. 1948 was Roswell, and in those years the UFO scene was essentially born and matured almost to the state it is today in the, in the, in the course of like a year. We, we immediately got people saying, what are these flying saucers? What is the government trying to hide? Does the government have evidence of it? You know, what's being covered up? So you know, if you believe that UFOs have been visiting us since the, the 1940s, then the government would have to know about it. You know, there's, there's no way it can be just some kind of accident that the, the government's just so inept that they, they don't have any evidence. They would have to have evidence if, if all these actual incidents were true. You know, going back to Roswell, a lot of people, lots of people think that Roswell actually was a, crash, a crashed uh, um, alien spacecraft or some kind of, uh, some kind of craft. There have to be a, a cover-up, which means that you're essentially suggesting a theory that involves this big conspiracy of the government. And if you believe that, I think it makes it 
a bit easier for you to believe other conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories that are more consequential. So if you could believe that the government is hiding uh, contact with aliens or evidence of aliens or something along those lines from you and has been doing it for 70 years, then it's fairly easy to believe that the government might be covering up something like does the vaccine uh, work or you know is coronavirus real or is is global warming uh, man-made or not and you know, is there anything we can do about it you can start to distrust the government and distrust science if you believe that there's a huge conspiracy and not just a huge conspiracy but a huge and very well-run conspiracy where you know, you've got this men in black coming around and shutting people up and you've got all these um bits of evidence that are hidden away in, in lockers somewhere and uh, all these sightings somehow never get leaked out from 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 the military uh it just i think it's not hugely damaging i would say but it does lead a little bit in that direction yeah it's sort of the gateway for sure but you know the struggle yeah. i have with that mick is um i personally don't believe the roswell incident was uh, mm. extraterrestrial in origin but what i do believe is there was definitely a cover-up of some kind sure like that's that's basically been proven um but yeah. that's hard because one part of me is like i know it wasn't probably aliens at least in my personal research and in investigation and i know a lot of people will vehemently disagree with me but um it's hard because there was a cover-up so then you're like okay maybe it wasn't aliens maybe the the quintessential modern ufo era that started mm -hmm. with roswell wasn't aliens but does that mean that none of it is or what do we do there because they covered something up so how do we sure. trust them <laughs> yeah uh that's the thing though i mean i, I shouldn't i'm not advocating blind trust in the government i certainly wouldn't say you trust everything that people in power say because people in power will lie to you and people in power, a lot of them are just doing things for their own personal gain. And you know, right now you've got two political parties and they're saying essentially opposite things. So one or both of them is kind of lying to you when they talk about either present a certain figure in a certain way or they, they make claims about what's going on at the border or what's going on with uh, the coronavirus relief program and things like that. You know, you've got people who contradict each other so politicians are kind of lying to you you know you maybe you don't know which ones are lying to you but you know politicians are generally not your friend people become politicians a lot of them for their own personal reasons some of them are very well meaning some of them are idealistic and they they want to actually do good for the country but uh, either you know some of them are not or they they become not and uh, don't trust them so when you look at something like you know Roswell, a long time ago, obviously, and it's very difficult to get a, a real handle on uh, what happened. Uh, yeah, we, we know that there was uh, a bunch of different stories that came out at the start. So they couldn't all be true. So what happened there? You know, was it just mistakes or were, were people lying? And you know, we, we know that uh, the later story is that uh, the first stories were essentially covers for this Project Mogul, where they had these, these these microphones on balloons that they were using to listen for, for nuclear explosions in the atmosphere uh, because they wanted to detect when Russia was, was letting off nuclear bombs, which is a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do and a perfectly reasonable thing for them to keep secret and to have some kind of cover story for. So these things happen. There's there's secrecy. And this is this is one of the one of the big issues in, in ufology is that a lot of the questions that people ask are unanswerable because you're asking them about stuff that is hidden behind the military's wall of secrecy and uh, some of the things might get answered after whatever the statute of limitations is for these these things like you know roswell more information came out of it uh, about it but uh you know, when you ask people about the nimitz encounter there's there's data there that we just don't have access to because it's classified because it was recorded on classified systems and we probably never will well by, by never i mean never in the foreseeable uh you know decade or two uh so but yeah you know, does that right does that raise to a level of being a a cover-up uh or some kind of is it the government lying to you or the government just like not telling you stuff because it's secret right. big difference uh, so, yeah 
yeah, and, and that itself is opaque. We we don't know the reasons for it, and and then it allows people to read into these things, like the the lack of detail in the UAP report. Yeah, is that because there's nothing really interesting there, and it's just like video and, and radio that was recorded using systems that are classified so they're not going to show them to you or is it because it shows a close-up of a flying saucer zipping around and diving into the ocean right. it's very easy to imagine it might be one or the other and if your preference your personal preference is that it is some kind of ufo zipping around and diving into the ocean yeah you're probably going to be more likely to believe that's the type of thing that's being covered up whereas my personal experience with UFO investigations is that things generally do not turn out to be very interesting. And I actually anticipate all this secret stuff in the secret annex that has been hidden from us to be pretty boring stuff, you know, stuff that's basically like the gimbal video, uh, probably the most interesting video that's actually in there. I don't really think they've got anything more interesting than that. Interesting. Well, yeah, let's fast forward up to that because you bring up a good point of the ambiguity and um, in, you know, the New York Times before the report came out, um, they went so far as to even change the headline of an article um, to include, you know, possible. We're not ruling mm -hmm. out aliens, um, but then you've got people like Elizondo and even, you know, uh, members of the, the national, uh, excuse me, Navy intelligence and whatnot saying, we're almost 100% certain it's not black budget U.S. tech and it's not foreign adversarial tech. And of course, that leaves a huge gap between what it could be and what it's mm -hmm. not. And, you know, I know you've spoken to Zach Saichi, um, who actually I, you know, we had a good conversation of that's that's almost irresponsible of the military of the government to kind of throw that option out there because then you do get everyone filling in those gaps and you do fuel the conspiracy yeah. because of the lack of transparency would you agree with that or yeah what do you think about I, that? i think so. i think but that's kind of missing a few things there like when you say uh it's it's not foreign tech and it's not our own secret tech um like you look at the uap report and the things they listed and those were, I believe, uh, items three and four. Uh, items one and two in the list, number one was uh, uh, airspace clutter, things like birds, balloons, uh, drones, and uh, 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 debris like plastic bags. Yeah, they even listed that. That was, that was the first thing they listed. And the second thing they listed is atmospheric effects. So things like inversion layers or ice clouds, things causing radar returns to, to bounce off or you know, even visual sightings of little white dots in the sky and things like that. And the third thing they list is, uh, I believe, US technology, which might be three or four, I can't remember, US technology, like secret programs or maybe SpaceX testing something, something like that. And then they, then they say they don't have enough information and they, they, they have no evidence that that is the case. Then they list foreign adversaries and they, they, they say even less about that. And then the fifth thing they list is other. But people kind of frame this as if the only options are US technology, foreign technology, or other. When they missed out the first two things that were listed, and, you know, the first thing was airspace clutter. People just mm -hmm. seeing things like drones and balloons in the air because there's this cluttered airspace. The training ranges off, off Virginia, wherever they are exactly, uh, Virginia Beach, uh, they have you know, balloons drifting into the, air, into the airspace and they think that causes an issue. The atmospheric effects, maybe there's, there's, there's things we don't understand yet about the atmosphere that's uh, uh, like perhaps some kind of electrical discharge type thing, something, you know, ball lightning type thing uh, that, that happens. Uh, and these were the first two things that they listed. And I don't think they listed them just to get them out of the way. I think they listed them first because those were probably the most common uh, plausible explanations for these things. So it's not just you know, three, four, and five. It's one, two, three, four, and five. And you've really got to consider the possibility that most, if not all, of the, the sightings could fall in the first two categories. Right. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think people tend to forget about those first two for sure. Um, but again, it, it just it frustrates me because then you know that most of the UFO community are going to they always do. They go to alien and it, it's hard because, yeah, I 
I I'm in the UFO world 24 seven. So it's, um, you know, I always keep that door open that some of it might be ET tech that's visited sure. us, but we have absolutely no definitive evidence that that's ever occurred. And then yeah. you have the whole idea of connecting alien to UFO. And that's a whole issue in itself. Yeah. And yeah, you know, the UAP report didn't rule out the possibility of aliens. And that was what the, right? the, the headline. Yeah, the, the, they changed the headline from uh, in the New York Times. The first headline was something like um, UAP report finds no evidence of aliens. And they changed it to something else like UAP report uh, has multiple unidentified craft cannot rule out the possibility of aliens, right. which was, I think, almost just like the editors kind of sexing up the, the story. They wanted the story to have a more interesting headline. It didn't really change right. the, the contents of the story. You know, the fact that you haven't ruled out aliens is utterly meaningless. If you see a UFO and it's a, a little white dot and it's zipping around the sky, if it remains unidentified, which obviously all of these these cases were, these were the ones that were unidentified, you know, the ones that, the cream of the crop, the ones that rose to the top, the ones that were not filtered out by being identified. If it's unidentified, it's literally impossible to rule out aliens. I mean, how, how could you possibly rule out aliens? So it's kind of a meaningless statement to say that uh, we, we haven't ruled out the possibility of aliens. They didn't raise it as a serious possibility which I think is significant. Uh, I think the reason they didn't raise it as a serious possibility is that there wasn't really anything that pointed towards it. We, gotcha. we see things like these supposedly fast-moving objects. They say um, they could be sensor error and they could be observer misperception. This is something that they say very specifically in the, the page two of the report, the executive summary. They say that it could be sensor error or spoofing or observer misperception. They get those, those three things. And you know, those, those, I think, are just far more likely explanations than aliens. Now, obviously, we can't rule out aliens. Uh, we can't rule out that we're living in the matrix and somebody at the higher level is tweaking with the codes to send in UFOs from another uh, simulated dimension either. But right. you know, why do we need to go to those explanations if there's no actual ex evidence for those that, that suggests that those are the likely things? D is it actually more likely that it's aliens than the radar not working right? You look at something like the Nimitz encounter. You know what's more likely if you just take just take the one case. Say uh, Kevin Day saw something drop from twenty eight thousand feet to five hundred feet in zero point seven eight seconds. You know the story varies a bit, but you know that's roughly that that thing. That's something that would be uh, impossible for any um, craft that we know of. So it's, it's not you know, current human technology. So it's either you know. A, a number of things it's either somebody some human has developed some amazing technology or aliens have this uh, amazing technology you know come to visitors or you know it's some kind of dimensional hologram or something if you go for the more esoteric jacques valet type explanations or the radar just wasn't working there was some kind of bug in the radar that was causing these glitches and that's what they originally thought you know they thought originally that it was this this bug in the radar but then of course you layer on these other things you know Fravor goes out to look at it, and he sees something. Uh, comes back, somebody else goes out, takes a video, sees something. And then the fact that you've got all these things happening at the same time, people start to think, well, you know, it's impossible that that could just be a coincidence. But then the question there really is, is it? Is it impossible? Is it really that much of a coincidence that these things would happen? Like people were getting all worked up about uh, seeing uh, UFOs because the radar has been glitchy for a few days and they, they go out and they, they get one crappy video of it and this, this rather strange sighting of something that, that Fravor and Dietrich saw. You know, is that literally impossible? Or, or could it be something a bit more mundane? Uh, mm -hmm. That you know, perhaps the radar wasn't working or perhaps he came across some, uh, I don't know, some tow target balloon or, or some, kind of a, a, some kind of drone that, the, that they were testing or something else was happening. You know, yeah, it, we don't need to say that it has to be aliens simply because 
uh, the other explanations seem less likely. I think, you know, even if you prefer the aliens thing, you've really got to keep the other explanations on your list as possibilities. Which Absolutely. is something I try to do. Yeah, say, and I know. I mean, I think, you know, if you consider yourself a self-proclaimed ufologist or UFO investigator, like your job is to find a conventional prosaic explanation, not to prove little green men are coming here from, you know, Zeta Reticuli. And then you start checking off the boxes until you get to that. It's still an unknown, but that doesn't still mean it's alien. But um, Mick, I did want to, you touched on something really important and I saw you tweet this recently. Um, Cause I know there's been a lot of, uh, you know, anger and um, I guess debate online when it comes to uh, pilots and uh, mm -hmm. being, you know, observability and like you said yeah. um, misinterpretation or misidentification um, and people get really upset because we do kind of hold pilots and you know people in the military or whatnot um, as the most trained observers out there and I do want to read this verbatim so I get it right um, you said uh, in the context of observing UFOs what training do trained observers receive what do they think they or, uh, yeah, what do they receive? What do you personally think they sh should receive in terms of that? And do you think, you know, that would help in solving a lot of these cases? Well, no, the problem here is that pilots are trained to recognize uh, things. So they're trained to recognize things like planes. So uh, they, 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 do, they do have training for recognizing planes mm -hmm. and judging what it's... Uh, its aspect is, you know, which way it's facing relative to you. Is it a tail on aspect? Is it a side aspect? Is it head on aspect? Is it going up? Is it going down? That type of thing. But they're trained to do that with planes. I think it'd be very difficult and not particularly useful use of time to train pilots to be UFO observers because you know, it's that's not really part of what a pilot does is look for UFOs and... Uh, record them accurately. The majority of pilots never see a UFO. You know, all the pilots I've talked to have not had a UFO experience. It might seem like there's lots of them, but really if you look at the number of pilots, it's it's not it's not very many that actually have these UFO experiences. So, you know, if if you know if our primary purpose here was to solve this UFO conundrum, then I would expect pilots to have courses in re recording what they saw visually. But mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of a bit silly as well. You know, why, why are we relying upon the pilots looking at something and then writing down what they saw? Why don't we if, we, if we're going to devote resources to this, why don't we get cameras installed in the cockpit so that we can actually you know, take video of these things the pilots saw? Uh, we often see, we, we hear of these things being very close there was one account, uh, I think it's kind of grown in the telling of this uh, this uh, spherical object that flew between two planes. And I think it was as close as like 100 feet or something. Now, if, if we had a, a dash cam in those planes, we would have good footage. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, a allocation of resources type thing. I don't think the Navy and the, uh, the Air Force are going to be training people to look at UFOs unless there's something that will come of it. Now, let's say we, we start having more sightings of, say, drones uh, from planes because the Chinese are sp sending in spy drones. Then maybe then we'd, we want to have you know, more specific training on, again, on looking at what these things are and describing them. But yeah, drones are fairly easy to recognize. It's these, these things that, that we, we have have trouble with like i think what i would go back to there is like fravor and dietrich's encounter in what training did david fravor have that allowed him to see exactly how big this thing was and how it was moving and uh, uh and how far away it was because my, my theory there is that he he misperceived how far away it was and that gave him this illusion of of, of high speed when he he moved, you know, it was it, it seemed like it was circling him, but I think it was actually stationary, and he was circling it, and it was just because he misperceived the distance. I don't think there's actually specific training there, unless you start training for that exact scenario. Like, you know, if you if you see a featureless object 
what steps can you take to determine how big it is? You know, that's kind of like, uh, you know, and, and try to check your assumptions. You know, maybe you're going to assume that it's the same size as a Hornet, uh, but perhaps it may be a different size. So, you know, check that out. But just going, touching back on your first point there, people get upset when I, I say perhaps the pilots made a mistake. Well, you know, these pilots are tough people. Yeah, you know, they're men and women who go into battle and they're they're shot at and they shoot at other people. They're they're tough people. You know, they can take it. Uh, I don't think um, I don't think they're going to get their feelings hurt by me. They should be able to have a an honest discussion about whether they made a mistake or not. And uh, I think you know David Fravor discussed this this issue with Lex Fridman about a year ago. I think. Uh, and he didn't seem too upset about it. He, he kind of mocked the the idea somewhat, but he, he wasn't like upset. He wasn't he wasn't crying because I'd hurt his feelings. Uh, I I I think people are rushing to the defense of pilots as if I'd somehow you know spat on their grave or something. It's it's nothing like that. I'm just raising an issue. Uh, could they have made a mistake? And in some cases, I think, yes, they did make a mistake. And in some fairly specific cases, I point out where I think the mistake actually was, like Chad Underwood, I think. Uh, he, I think he lost Locke. You know, Chad Underwood filmed the Nimitz Tic Tac video. And I think he lost Locke on the object just because he was flipping around through the camera modes. And then he didn't regain it because he didn't zoom out at the end. And I think he just basically messed up uh, there. Uh, but you know, people will start saying that I'm, I don't know, it's this, this terrible insult, but no, I just think that's what happened. And if you disagree with me, then, then that's fine. But you know, what am I going to do? Like just default to believing every single thing a pilot says, but just because they're a pilot and I might hurt their feelings. No hurt feelings have no place in this, this discussion. Let's just focus on the facts and try to figure out what those facts are. I, I understand that facts don't care about feelings. They never have, never will. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate that you would take the time to speak to people like Alex Dietrich and actually have a conversation. Um, and I know that's kind of kind of my my last personal question for you, Mick, um, before we do some listener questions, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Dave Felch, Chris Lito, these guys who have been making these videos lately talking about, you know, how how you're wrong about this or that, or you weren't there. Like this is, this is, that's ufology. Basically you weren't there when it happened. You can't tell me what I saw or what I experienced. And I respect that. Like, no, I wasn't, I, I wasn't there. I can't say you weren't, you know, that you know, there's aliens living in a cave in the Mojave desert. Like I wasn't there when you first saw them or, or this or that. So it makes sense. I get the whole, you weren't there, but um, what, where do you lay right now in terms of those who kind of respond to what you bring forward on YouTube well, or whatnot without even reaching out to you? A lot of them weren't there either. <laughs> uh, you look at those those people. There's you know Dave Falch, who is a is a guy who um, repairs FLIR equipment, and he he has equipment uh, to test, and he's he spent a lot of time in the the back parking lot of where he works, I believe. Uh, taking videos of, of planes, trying to disprove uh, my theories, which I think he's totally failed to do. And just o over the the years, I mean, literally years that I've been interacting with him, he basically just doesn't understand the entire theory that I'm putting forward anyway. And so it's very difficult to talk to him. The problem is, like, people think that you know he's an expert. You know, he's an expert because he he works uh, for a company that does these 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 FLIR systems. Uh, and he claims to understand them. So, and because they they like having experts who disprove what I say, they they believe what he has to say, but they don't actually understand it. You know, the, the, a lot of the problem I have is that these issues are complicated, and so I have difficulty explaining them to people. So people don't understand my explanation. And then someone else comes along and they give another explanation and, and they say they are an expert, but the listeners often don't understand that explanation either. Uh, I, I often challenge people to say, what is Dave Falch's objection to the rotating glare hypothesis? And when you dig into it, he doesn't really have one. He's just, he's just saying, oh, you know, 
infrared is is different to to visible light because it's heat and it's not it's not light and they don't use lenses they use mirrors so you wouldn't get glare and it'd be narrow field of view so you don't get glare you know a bunch of things that are not true uh, and they're kind of irrelevant and it says you you couldn't rotate the 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 glare with this derotation mechanism. So there's there's all these little complicated things that you know it sounds good when an expert comes along, but you know he 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 doesn't really understand the argument I'm making. And this is something uh, an issue I've had over and over again is that people come along and they they try to debunk what I'm saying without even understanding it. Um, uh, was Lou Elizondo when he came on my podcast? We discussed the rotating glare hypothesis. He didn't understand it. And he tried to explain to me why why I was wrong. Literally, he started out right there trying to debunk me. He said, no, Mick, that's not true because you'd have one ex one rotating thing here and another rotating, and they would both rotate together. And so I told him he, he didn't understand it and kind of explained it to him. Uh, and he did actually listen to me, which was which was great. But a lot of people won't. They will just they will just steadfastly say it's impossible for a glare to rotate independently of the object. Uh, or independently of the horizon, something like that. And it's because they don't understand what the actual argument is, because it takes some time and effort to, to get into it. I don't think that um, David Fravor has really uh, looked into a lot of the stuff that I've, I've done that he just kind of dismisses out of hand, like the FLIR 1 video zipping off. I don't think he's really looked into the issue of it, it losing lock. I don't know if even Chad Underwood has really looked into it in, in great depth. Um, and there was a, a, a another uh, FLIR expert who was on Jeremy Corbell's show, and he was asked a bunch of questions that were completely the wrong questions to ask. He, he was asked, does the derotation mechanism rotate the glare independently of the horizon? To which the answer is no, and he correctly answered no and explained why. And people said, oh, well, then the mix being debunked, but it was the wrong question. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a great difficulty here with, with experts coming in and giving their opinion without actually understanding what the question actually is and what the issue actually is. And these these things can be solved by by talking. I, I yeah. sat down and talked to Chris Leto after one of his videos and we kind of got into some detail and uh, I think we resolved a few things. But now Chris has gone off and he's done a whole bunch of other videos and he's got sucked into the, the SCU's explanation of things and he thinks the SCU is amazing. Uh, uh, and, you know, he's just going off saying Mick's wrong without without talking to me. Alpha Check, another guy on Twitter, he's a, an Egyptologist who's really into using the DCS flight simulator and he's done a bunch of really nice slick videos that explain the links between the the FLIR system and the uh, the radar system, uh, the SA page and how they all link together and you know, tracking and things like that, and says that he's debunked me. Uh, but you know, again, he's he's never actually talked to me. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to talk to him for quite a while, but you know, he 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 doesn't seem uh, like he wants to. He just wants to make a video. Like, uh, but so I I think all this arguing via video isn't super productive it's better to actually have a discussion and i'd love to have a discussion with you say david fravor or, or chad underwood but you know they don't want to talk to me yeah it, it's tough because i understand and that's what why i respect what you do nick because you're you're willing to say i want to talk to you about it like let's get as much facts and data as we can and um you know it's just their minds are kind of made up at this point which which yeah is kind of um, disappointing. And, you know, while I may, I don't agree with you on everything, I can respect that you have an educated opinion on these things uh, more than I could ever possibly have. So I'm going to be open to that. And I think that's the problem is, you know, again, people are so steadfast in their ways or, or like you said, maybe they just want to put a response video out there because they know it'll get traffic. Um, everyone has their own intentions and, motivations when it comes to these sorts of things um, yeah that's kind of my personal observation on that but um yeah did you want to respond to that sorry no I, mean, I kind of agree with you there it's uh people i think have different motivations for what they're doing in ufology and some people are doing it for clicks i tend to assume that people are not and i, I always approach people as if you know they just want to have an honest 
dialogue and they want to get to the truth. But you know, if people are kind of deliberately, or perhaps not deliberately, but they're, they're, they're asking the wrong questions of an expert, like say, you know, Jeremy Corbell does this all the time. Jeremy Corbell won't talk to me. He won't even mention my name. He doesn't want to give me any publicity. Uh, but he, he will have uh, an expert on to, to debunk me when, you know, what would be better is if, if that expert, if you've got a, an actual FLIR expert, you could talk directly to me and we could go back and forth and we could hammer out where our actual areas of disagreement are and try to resolve them. And that's something I, I, I do in, you know, all the interactions I have with conspiracy theories. It's part of the, the, the backbone of, of my book, uh, is this method of getting down to some kind of common ground and then trying to identify the the next step up where you actually disagree. So, you know, we agree that, you know, this video was taken by a Navy jet and that it shows um, something that's, that's, that's probably a, a, a flying craft of some sort off in the distance. You know, we could agree about that. And then we start to disagree about uh, does it lose lock at the end on this, this video, whatever it is, or is it rotating, things like that. So you say, why, why, why do we have a disagreement here? Mm -hmm. uh, is it, you know, what's, what am I basing my belief, my opinion uh, on this, this rotation or whatever it is on? And what are you basing yours on? And perhaps, perhaps I'm missing something that you could explain to me, or perhaps you're missing something that I could explain to you, or perhaps we're both missing something, or perhaps we're not missing anything, but we're just failing to communicate. Perhaps we're talking past each other in some way. Mm -hmm. But that's very difficult to do if all you're doing is putting out a video and uh, waiting you know, months before you interact with anybody. Uh, I put out videos because I'm trying to explain what my, my thoughts are on particular theories. I'm not trying to argue that, you know, it's not aliens. I'm trying to say, this is what I think this video shows. But if someone disagrees with me, like, let's talk. Let's right. actually, you know, discuss what the reason is that you think that this object didn't lose lock or that you think it's a distinct object rotating. And, you know, I'll explain why I think the other thing, and then we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll actually move forward. And yeah. you know, something that happens a lot is, my arguments change and evolve because they get challenged. That's why I like, you know, that's why I like putting them on Twitter or on Facebook. You know, some people say like, oh, Mickey, you should, you should submit your, your ideas for peer review publication in a scientific journal, and then I will read it. And that's just nonsense. Uh, <laughs> what's the point of doing that? You know, I, I spend three months getting a paper out and just so somebody can point out an error in it. I just put the idea out now Someone can point out the error, I revise it, then put it out again. Another person points out the error, and we have this discussion about what's actually going on. A whole bunch of people can work on it. Um, more errors will be found. Things will get better. It will evolve in, in increments and, and, and improve. But if you, if you just start like formulating your theory into a paper, it's just, it's just a waste of time. You know, unless you've actually got some kind of scientific study where you've got testable, reproducible results, you may as well just stick it on Twitter and yeah. let people at it because it's going to get a lot better that way. It will be a lot better argument at the end of it if it goes through the fire of being critiqued by Twitter and Facebook and Metabunk. Yeah, yeah, you're kind of chiseling away at the sculpture and uh, trying yeah. to get the uh, the full definitive uh, statue, I guess. That's a weird analogy, but um, Mick, do you mind if we move to uh, some listener questions I have for sure, you? Sure, yeah. Yes, go for it. Awesome. What's up, guys? Ryan Sprague here, and I'm just dropping in to remind you about our Patreon campaign. Somewhere in the Skies is always free to consume, but it's not free to create. So if you want to help the show on a monthly basis, we have tons of rewards for you in return, including shoutouts on the show and website, bonus content and episodes, and free merch. Want to be my guest or pick a topic for the show? You can do that too. So if you'd like to learn more and to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you and keep looking up. So Ricardo asks, if you had a chance to analyze classified material, would you look at it even if that implied that you could not publicly acknowledge 
that this additional information changed or at least challenged your stance on some cases you personally looked into? Definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, Lou Elizondo isn't allowed to tell us about the classified information that he has, but he he doesn't seem to have any problem with he, uh, saying that he believes what he does because of things he has seen. Uh, I don't think you can kind of do such a blanket classification uh, that would include you know me saying hey, I've seen things that have convinced me that there's something to this phenomena. Example, example phrased. Don't take that one out of context. Yeah. Uh, and that you know, so yeah, I definitely would look at these things. Yeah, you know, even if I was unable to discuss the specifics or even the the nature of them ever again, then I would know, and it would uh, presumably change my approach uh, to everything else if I got some some evidence that pointed to a certain outcome. Gotcha. Yeah, I like that. Um, Nug4T on Reddit asks, do you know anything about the AI project that Elizondo and DeLong have talked about in regards to capturing and analyzing UFOs? Do you happen to know if this requires new legislation in regards of new using private domestic video? Yeah, anything on that? Uh, well, uh, what, what they want to do is they basically... You know, the big problem we have in ufology is that we get a shitload of ufo reports and ufo videos and they're they're, they're nearly all crap i mean let's face it i mean yeah 99.99 percent of them are crap and there's a small percentage that might not be but we don't we can't really tell if they're real or not but it's difficult to to find things in this so the, the ai idea is you know something that uh, has only become possible in recent years is that we we train an AI to find interesting cases or to find anomalies. So we, we show it cases and then we tell it what these cases are. And then we show it some other cases and it tries to see, you know, is this a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a balloon? Uh, can we eliminate it? And then it will try to figure out, is, is there actually something unusual going on? And it might even just be a kind of a st statistical thing, like perhaps there's more things going on near nuclear power stations or something like that. But you, you can train AI to do things like that. You can train it to look at videos. I don't think there's any issue with um, using public video. Uh, I think either it's going to be a video that's kind of in the semi-public domain, like YouTube videos and things like that. I don't know if there's... There's a specific thing that says you couldn't download a YouTube video to to analyze it. Doesn't seem to make any sense. But you know, a lot of this stuff is stuff that people submit to online databases like MUFON. Uh, that they probably would be given permission to for for researchers to look at uh, that video. Uh, so I think it's a good idea. I I doubt it's going to come to anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have a broad enough or a an accurate enough collection net right now to actually get the data like if you had a network of cameras and radars around the country that were recording 24 7 kind of like the galileo project uh maybe you could get some some quality data but i don't think you could really get anything useful if you took like say all uh 120,000 cases that are in the mufon database right now i i really doubt very much that there's anything uh, even the most advanced AI could pull out of that. But yeah. it's certainly it's, uh, the way to go. Right. It, you, but you're right. It's challenging when you don't really have a base level to kind of, you know, work off of. So mm -hmm. I totally get that. Yeah. Well, what do you think about um, the Galileo project and what Avi Loeb is doing? Is that something you would support? I mean, not like financially or anything, um, but like, is that something you think... Uh, is worth the time, the effort, the money. Uh, you know, it's being funded by Harvard, essentially, um, and, you know, private donors as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I don't think it is. I think it's mostly private stuff uh, and okay. you know, kind of, you know, his, his, uh, um, you know, his, his what is discretionary spending that he has. He can do whatever project he likes because he's a tenured professor. Uh, I think, I doubt it, anything will come of it. I, I mm -hmm. don't think that it's very likely that you would get enough of these high-powered telescopes around the country to find uh, anything of interest based on just the frequency of, of the sightings of UFOs. I, I, I don't really see 
anything happening other than getting close-up photographs of birds and balloons and planes and drones and plastic bags and then other things you will you will have photos it will it, you will have photos of things that is just too far away even for this you know fifty thousand uh, dollar telescope or you know half a million dollar telescope that he, he wants to use for the project there's always going to be something that's too far away and you've got these limiting factors like the distance obviously but the atmosphere the atmosphere distorts things if you're looking from the ground at something that's 20 miles away through the atmosphere you can't get close enough picture of it because you the atmosphere is too too wobbly so i think it's unlikely that anything will come of it i i don't really mind private individuals spending their own money on something like that it's, it'd be fun and i think it would be good if if you do get a lot of these these cameras out there what's going to happen is it's just a little bit more evidence of absence from absence of evidence if if ufos were flying around up there in any kind of frequency we'd be getting photos of them and the absence of evidence kind of indicates that there's not very many of them if any and mm. i think that's what's going to happen with project galileo is you know, people are kind of throwing the money away, I think, but it will at least get you a bunch of close-up photographs of of things, and it would be good examples. So you can say, like, you know, this looks like a white blob on my iPhone, but, yeah, you know, with this amazing telescope, we can see it was actually a plane, or it was actually a drone, or it was actually a solar balloon, or whatever it was. Interesting. Yeah, and, you know, um, I've heard you bring up, too, that, like, you know, the wonder of magic can be just as powerful as the wonder of science. And, you know, that's, if that's what we get, maybe they capture some amazing weather anomaly that we've never, maybe. you know, seen before. And that could be just as exciting and cool, in my opinion, as yeah. possibly a craft from another, whatever, interstellar object or whatnot. Yeah, I, I mentioned something in a, another podcast, I think with UFO Jane, about a thing called uh, the Crown Flash which I'd encourage anybody to look at, look up on YouTube. Uh, Crown Flash is this amazing atmospheric phenomena that looks like aliens having some kind of battle on top of a cloud. But it's just a natural phenomena. But it's something that was never recorded on video until about ten years ago. Uh, but it's you know there are things in the atmosphere that we don't fully understand. We don't fully understand how Crown Flashes work. Uh, we can tell there's some kind of combination of uh, charged uh, uh, charged particles and ice cloud orientation and stuff like that but we don't know the exact uh, mechanism uh, so that you know there, there could well be interesting things that get discovered maybe we'll discover there's a lot more I don't know plastic bags floating around in the sky than we actually thought that there were or that there are some high-flying birds that are <laughs> responsible for some of this but yeah I think the likelihood of being able to catch one of the very elusive um, UAPs is pretty low. Yeah. Hey, that's why I got into all this, make plastic bags up in the air. <laughs> I've got plenty of them in the trees here in New York City. It's an interesting uh, environment we have here. Um, well, on a personal level, Audrey on Facebook wants to know, how has the exposure experience, positive and negative attention, affected you on a personal level? Um, did you ever feel like calling it quits and just walking away? from um, the UFO community, or I guess the conspiracy community overall? Um, occasionally, but that's not really because of the reaction I get. It's, it's more because it becomes a little, a little stagnated and a little boring. Mm -hmm. uh, if nothing's really happening in a, in a field, I, I kind of get a bit bored with it. I happened with chemtrails a while back. Uh, I believe in like 2010, I think I was getting really bored with chemtrails. And then this story came along of this, what looked like a missile being shot off, off the coast of Los Angeles. And uh, it was really interesting and everybody was really into solving it. And I ended up on CNN explaining it was just, just a contrail. I remember that. Like, yeah. Yeah. A long time ago though. Uh, so yeah, I, I, the reactions I get from people, I, I don't mind. It's, it's understandable that some people are going to have negative reactions. There are some people who have very strong uh, beliefs that the government is lying to them, and so they 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 think I'm defending the government, which I'm which I'm not. They think I'm some kind of government shill uh, that I'm being paid to do this, and I can understand why they're thinking that from their point of view. You know, if they believe that 
the government is telling you all these lies and you would have to have these these shills to to help spread the lies i could see why they would they would think you know i would be one of them based on their beliefs i mean they they're wrong uh but i i understand it and if if someone has had a personal experience with a ufo uh if they 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 saw like you know a uh, a tr3b fly over their their house or their car or whatever or or, or even just a simple light in the sky or a v-shaped in the sky or something like that and they know what they saw yes they think they know that what they saw and then i come along and i say start saying things like oh it's easy to misperceive things or misremember things they get angry at me and i understand that because i'm 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 saying that you know they didn't see what they saw and they they know they saw what they saw so i can understand why people would get angry at me so I, i've actually got a lot more pushback in terms of emotional engagement from the UFO community that I have from uh, the uh, 9-11 and chemtrails and flat earth uh, conspiracies. Yeah. Uh, I think because it, people feel like I'm personally attacking them because they have some kind of personal involvement in this. You know, and a lot of yeah. people, even if they haven't seen a UFO, they've been really into it since they were young. And so it's this kind of foundational, almost religious level belief that they have that is very difficult for them to accept that they might have been wrong about it. And so they don't they don't like hearing the things that I am saying. So it's understandable. And yeah. I don't mind when people get angry at me. I just, you know, I know that it's coming generally from from a place of honesty. And if they're just being an asshole, then I just block them and move on. So <laughs> it doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting how much emotion plays into this and belief. I think belief is probably the worst word to have in the UFO yeah. field because it's nothing but a subjective truth. And once you bring religion into anything, you're going to rile up people's emotions because it's literally the framework in which they base their whole faith on. Um, so when someone challenges that, I can understand why people get passionate about it. Um, but like yeah. we said earlier, facts don't care about your beliefs or what you feel. Um, that's simply the, that's what it is. Yeah. And yeah, to get to those, that what, what the goal here is for me is to get to some kind of shared understanding of the facts. You know, it's fine if, if I figure out what something is, but no one believes me, it's kind of pointless. I, there's there's right. two parts to you know, debunking. You know, one is trying to figure out what's actually happening. And then the other part is trying to explain it to people. And the second part is actually kind of 90% of it. As yeah, once you figure point. something out, then you're done. But then you've got a whole world left who hasn't figured it out and doesn't understand your explanation or hasn't, hasn't heard of your explanation. And you've got to try to communicate it to them. But I, I, I think it can be done. Right? People, uh, People generally do want to know what's actually going on. It's just tricky to get past these defenses that they put up. And, you know, perhaps yes. I'm wrong. And perhaps yeah. by, by them talking to me, you, you, you could explain to me why I'm actually wrong. You know, David yep. Fravor, come and explain to me why, why I'm wrong about the gimbal rotation. But, you know, we'll figure <laughs> it out. It's not, it's not a battle. It's something that we can get together and mutually try to figure things out. You know, what is the problem with you know these numbers or whatever it is or this particular interpretation or what am i missing what are you missing yeah we can we can work it out yeah i and i feel you know in this field everyone proclaims that i just want the truth i just want to know the truth behind all this but then you know even if they got that truth they're not going to like it they're not going to be satisfied. And I always struggle with that because I feel like so many in this field say, I want the truth about what UFOs are. Yeah. But they don't well, really. I mean, I shouldn't say that. That's a sweeping assumption. But you know what I mean? Like they want they, the truth, yeah, but do. then when it comes to them, they don't accept it. But the truth is complicated. Uh, yeah. If people say the government should tell us the truth about UFOs, but they're kind of expecting a simple truth like uh ufos are visiting alien crafts and we don't think they're they're dangerous yeah the government comes out and says that that's the truth that people are looking for but the truth more likely is that pilots see a whole bunch of different things in the sky and we don't know 
what they are a lot of the time because there's insufficient information. Some of them kind of look like they're weird moving objects. That probably is the truth. The UAP report and the conclusions of the UAP report are, are that exactly. And that is probably the truth that the government has about UFOs. So when you ask the government needs to tell us the truth about UFOs, the UAP report could be that truth. It probably is the truth. But how do you how do you explain that? How do you how do you persuade people of that when there's all this stuff that's behind this wall of secrecy? Yep. Yep. Good point. Um, well, that kind of bleeds into this next one. Um, Serenity 404 on Reddit asks, do you follow any particular objective methodology process or checklist when you debunk stuff or um, let's see here stuff or if you just subjectively freestyle every debunk and does your approach even accommodate extraordinary conclusions like aliens um, or or stuff like that? Um, they they make a good analogy here, too. I just want to yeah. stress this. Um uh, let's see, like aliens, or if such conclusions are inherently unattainable in your mind, like a maze without an exit, they say. Well, my my pro problem solving um, methodology it came from this this book I have on my bookshelf. One second. Yeah. It's uh, the book is called How to Solve It by G. Polya, and it's this this you know it's a fairly old book that's uh, from the Open University, which is this kind of. Uh, it's online now, but it used to be a TV university, and it has it has a checklist in it. Uh, you know, it falls open on it, which is you know how to actually solve uh, problems. Yeah, you know, how to solve a problem, and you know it just lists a number of simple steps that you go through, and it's it's aimed at mathematical problems, but the the fundamentals of the methodology remain the same. And you know one of the most important things is to uh, look at the problem and see if it reminds you of something else you know the, the the biggest part of of my methodology for solving ufos is to um recognize things within the the, the data you know the, the the video or the photo or whatever it is and even if it's just a small part of it if you can't recognize the whole thing i say someone posts a, a jagged V of white dots moving across the sky, I can immediately recognize that as being some, some high-flying birds because I see high-flying birds all the time here. And I've seen lots of videos of them and I know what, exactly what they look like and I know that that would be the number one explanation. But if it's, say, just you know two white dots moving through the sky, that's something that you know, resembles the other thing, but it's less definitive. But you, you still, you've, you've found something that you've recognized, that it's you know, two dots in a kind of a diagonal line moving across could be birds, so that becomes a possibility. Now, mathematical problem solving is, is nice because there's usually only one answer, and you're just... Uh, working to unearth this answer and it's got all the data's right there on the page and you don't have to go anywhere. It's a lot messier when you've got UFOs. And yet, so one of the biggest parts of my methodology is what I call Occamic Ranking, named after uh, you know, Occam's Razor. You know, Occam's Razor is like the, the explanation with the fewest things that need adding to it is more likely the simpler explanation and the better explanation. And what I do is I try to think of all the possibilities that something might be, no matter how outrageous seeming. Like you get a white dot in the sky, what could it be? You know, it could be, it could be a fake video, it could be a bird, it could be a, a UFO, it could be a, an alien spaceship, it could be a hologram, it could be a ghost, it could be a fairy. Uh, it, it could be uh, a drone. You know, there's all these possibilities. And then you make a list of these. And then you, you can sort the list by just applying Occam's razor to any two of these things. And you say you've got, at the top of the list, you've got, say, a balloon or a fairy. And you think, which one of those is more likely? You know, it's going to be the balloon. So I'm going to stick the balloon on top and the, the fairy moves down the list. And you do what's called a bubble sort, where you just keep doing this until the list is in order. And it's, it's quite a straightforward uh, system, and it, it just means that you get a good idea of the range of possibilities. Now, when something's unknown, it 
doesn't mean that you don't have any idea what it might be. It means that you, you're not really narrowing in on one explanation. There's, there's a bunch of possible explanations. But you never want to rule anything out. So you always keep things on the list that are a bit less likely. Uh, but you know, usually what will happen is something will bubble to the top. But you've always got to keep revisiting all these other things on the list. And then you, you get new information, you get new data, you, or you perform experiments. You try to figure out, like, if I, if I hold my camera this way, will this white dot in the sky move in the same way that it does in this, this video? And if it does, then perhaps two things will flop, uh, flip positions in the list, and perhaps they won't. But as you get more and more data coming in, uh, the list may change, uh, things may separate out more, and then one thing may become much more clearer as the most likely explanation. But it's actually quite rare for you to be able to eliminate things. And uh, I, I try to shy away from premature elimination of hypotheses and keep everything on the table and then just keep getting more data and uh, seeing how the list changes. And that's basically my, my methodology uh, if you you know, kind of ignore all the the other stuff, which is stuff from experience. You know, the, it's difficult for someone to come in who knows nothing at all about analyzing photos and videos and you know, 3D trajectories, and then say, "How do you do this?" Uh, yeah. that's, it'd be a very complicated and tedious thing for me to describe. But the basic thing is, let's see, do you recognize things and think of possible explanations, make a list, and when new data comes in, revise the list and never take anything off the list. Interesting. Right. And of course, it's not perfect, but um, no. and UFOs tend to be one of the most rebellious things out there when it comes to that. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, it, it see, makes if sense. you had a very that simple, if you had a very simple methodology that you could apply to every single case, then you know we wouldn't be in this situation. We <laughs> yep. we we have UFOs because they're in the low information zone. The a UFO is only a UFO because it's it's ambiguous data. And if you've got something that's ambiguous data, that means there's multiple possible explanations. And the it might be that there's an, there's an unknown explanation is is the most the most likely thing. You know, some something else is is the most likely thing. If you you can't figure out like if we actually had sensor data and and video that showed a uh, I don't know a forty foot wide uh, tic tac moving across the ocean surface, then that would be very difficult for me to explain with uh, a list of possibilities. And right there, then something else. Is going to be the number one explanation. I and mean, what is that something else? It's a, a you know, advanced technology drone or it's an alien spaceship. Those things will lump, lump, uh, leap to the top. But most of the time, the data is very ambiguous. We don't have high fidelity, multi sensor data of something doing something amazing. We have crappy video of blurry blobs, or we have eyewitness accounts from uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so there's always going to be this, these, these ambiguous cases where making a list of possibilities is really what you should be doing. Yeah. And I know you've stressed too, like the clear photos of UFOs are the boring ones. It's the ambiguity that excites people most. And, um, that's tough. Cause yeah, you want it to be. Exciting, yeah, but why is, why is that <laughs> a, cl yeah. a clear photo of a UFO should be the exciting one, but you know, when right. it's clear, you can identify it. It's not unidentified anymore. Things, ambiguity is UFOs. It should be, we should rename it ambiguous flying objects, <laughs> I AFOs. You should uh, TM that. Because that's, that's the issue here. It's not just simply that they're unidentified, like it's, it's a plane. I don't know what type of plane it is. We should, we'd no idea what it is at all. Is it a flying object? Is it an optical effect? Is it an illusion? Is it, um, is it really far away and very large, or is it closer and is it small? It's just it's ambiguous. It's ambiguous flying objects, and it's uh, they're they're always going to exist. It's impossible yeah. to get rid of ambiguous flying objects because the, there's you know no matter which camera you have, there's always going to be something that's just a little bit further away than the, the resolvable range of that camera. You know the Project Galileo is going to return photographs of things that are twenty miles away, and they're just too far away to see. The details they're going to be it's just going to give you more ambiguous photographs hmm. yeah and I, you know i made peace a long time ago mick that uh i'm probably never gonna know what ufos are because like you said they 
yeah. are ambiguous and they always will be. But hey, I'm enjoying the journey. It's fun. Um, I've got a few little fun questions. Uh, sure. I could shoot at you rapid fire if you don't mind. And uh, before we wrap things up here. Um, so uplifting tweets on Twitter. And I'll actually lump this mm. with the next one. I Jove 001 on Twitter. They ask, who's your favorite personality in the UFO Twitter world or community? And what are your favorite UFO books, if there are any? Yeah. Uh, well, my favorite UFO book is ooh, The UFO Handbook by Alan Hendry, which was published nice. in, I think, 1977. And I like it because it's, it's a great, in 1979, it's a great uh, kind of investigation of uh, the state of ufology at the time. And it was written by a guy who was working with, with uh, Alan, J. Allen, what was it? Uh, yeah, J. Allen Hynek, director of the Center of UFO Studies at the UFO Center of UFO Studies. And he's a guy who's, you know, he's interviewed a thousand people uh, about the UFOs and it's got all this loads of really interesting stuff in it and it's got like checklists for what to do when you see a ufo and all these different individual cases and then all these these ifos that he, that they have like he has photographs of things that are identified and i find it just very interesting because it's very useful because it covers a lot of really good data really good information but it's also just fascinating because it's uh it's timeless even though it was from 1979 uh, what is that? That's like you know, over 40 years ago. It feels like it could have been written this year. It feels like it's uh, a book that you know, is dis describing the current situation. The only real difference is that we have a lot more cameras now. So that's uh, you know, the, the, one, the one change that we have. But everything else in it seems very, very similar. So highly recommended book. I don't think it's in print anymore. Hence, I've got this crappy old library copy that I bought on, uh, online somewhere. And my, my favorite people in uh, in ufology, I think the, the crowd at the Unidentified Celebrity Review, they're uh, are a lot of fun. Lewis and uh, Michael and uh, Rather and the others, mm -hmm. they, they put on a good show. But that's going to be interesting itself, isn't it? It's like <laughs> they put on a good show. It's all great entertainment and everything. But is it, is it actually progressing the scientific research into, into ufology? Uh, yeah, there's lots of characters in, in the UFO scene and, yeah, UFO Jesus, Ryan, uh, Ryan Robbins, mm -hmm. uh, he's a good guy. Uh, Passionate guy, I love him, yeah. Yeah, 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 and, and, and lots of people like, yeah, it's, it's a fun community, which is a blessing and a curse in a way. If you've got a community, you kind of get this little bit of group think, I think. And you get these, you know, you get you get cliques and schisms as well, where people they form groups and then they they, they start arguing with each other and they break up, uh, and someone does something and they go off in one direction and it, it becomes more about people than it does about the science, which I think is a bit of a problem. And people start being advocates for one particular interpretation. You know, some people think, um, what's his name? That. Uh, Oh, I can't remember his name now. The guy in the desert. Uh, the Lazar, desert. Bob Lazar. Oh, Bob, Bob Lazar. Lazar. So How could you a forget polarized, that becomes, <laughs> I know, I know. I, I'm terrible <laughs> with names. Bob Lazar becomes a polarizing figure, and you get the Bob Lazar fans versus the yeah, people who think Bob, Bob Lazar is, is a hoaxer uh, people. Yeah. And it just becomes... You, know, you, you get these arguing over, over minutiae. I mean, I, I saw... You know, a lot of these podcasts, like like this one, they become like discussing individuals, like like uh, valet and things like that, and uh, the background of Louis Elizondo. And you know, we really should be getting into the science, the actual nuts and bolts. What are these? What's the data that we have? What does the data show? Let's do the math, uh, and let's 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 move on. Let's be productive. And it's become a bit of a show, I think, uh, which you know, it's fine, but it's. It's not really my scene. <laughs> yeah, I like no, analyzing I, videos. I get that, you know, and I, uh, as someone who's like 240 episodes in or so, like I am at least here on Somewhere in the Skies trying to m make a stride to have a more scientific um, approach and talk to more scientists because it's so hard, Mick, I've noticed because you have someone like the late Stanton Friedman, um, who was a huge advocate of the 
um, ETH hypothesis when it came mm-hmm. to the source of UFOs, saying skeptics will, when they can't, you know, argue the data, they'll attack the person. Um, yeah. But then there's the flip side of that as well, where a lot of this does become just talking about the people instead of the yeah. actual data. So where is that that middle ground? I'm still trying to find it here on Somewhere in the That's Skies. An and I know thing. Luis is uh, too. Yeah. The, there's the issue, like the ad hom attacks, ad hominem attacks, where you're attacking the person instead of the argument. It's a big no-no. We should never do it. Uh, but there's there's the kind of the opposite of that, where we have this argument from authority, where someone makes a claim because they're an expert or they have a specific uh, type of experience or because you know they are the ones who were there and saw something. So if someone is making an argument that's saying, you know, I am an expert, therefore this is correct, then you kind of have to address that issue. Are they actually an expert? It's mm-hmm. If they're not actually presenting a reason why they think it's correct, then uh, I think it does become a valid uh, point that you have to counter. You know, um, David Fravor said, Said, said he he knew he was right about the Nimitz encounter and what he saw was this this object that circled him and flew away rapidly because he had 12 years experience flying planes mm-hmm. and but when he was asked like how did he determine how far away it was he just said you know it's basically experience so it, questioning that assertion i think is a valid thing you, you can't just go on the data if pe- other people are making uh, arguments that do not rely on data or do not actually have any logic in them. And they're just saying, oh, I know what I saw. If someone says they know what they saw, it still is a valid point to question that they might not have, have seen what they thought they saw. You know, I'm sure that they're being honest. I'm sure their their recollection is that they saw this particular thing in a certain way, but their interpretation might not be correct and their memory might not be correct. And it is it is a valid thing to go on that. But you know, when you get into deeper things like you know Lou Elizondo, uh, is it good that he uses a sock puppet account on Twitter or not? Things like that. It's just like you know wh- why even talk about that? It just becomes this big drama uh, that you know people are talking about the person without even getting close to the actual subject which is you know are these ufos performing amazing maneuvers and that's based on the data yep i think a lot of people get involved in this ufo twitter sphere because of the drama like it gives them something to do for the day and yeah look we're all creatures of we like drama there's a reason you know theater exists and a reason we like arguments and everything um but yeah, it, I think that often clouds the actual discussions um, being had. And it, it, like you said, it becomes way more about that. And it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. Yeah. And this goes for any community or subculture. Like, it's this isn't yeah, just yeah. ufology. I don't want people to think we're bashing just the UFO community. This, I'm sure this happens in the skeptic world as well, where you start sure. attacking the person instead of what they're actually bringing forward. Yeah, in, in the skeptic community, the, there's a big issue with uh, you know stuff like political correctness and uh, gender issues and things like that, and this kind of camps. You know, there's the grumpy old men on one side and saying, "Well, why can't we have things like the way they were?" <laughs> and then you've got the younger crowd coming in and saying, uh, "You know, you've got to use the right pronouns," uh, things like that. And then people start arguing about that. You know, the issues of of gender equity and gender identity within the skeptical community. And it's kind of like it's a distraction, but you know, this, they're raising valid points. But now we're just talking about the social aspect of it and the political aspect of it, and you know what's going on in this organization, and how how should skeptics present themselves in public, and what what issue should we address? Whereas, you know, I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I like to look at videos of UFOs and figure out what they are. I like to dig into claims that people make about vaccine statistics and see whether the numbers add up. You know, I like to do that type of thing. And this this other stuff is a, it's a bit of a, um, a distraction. Not to say that there, there are people aren't raising valid issues, but, right. you know, it's not helping uh, figure out what UFOs are. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And it transcends the topic you're ultimately kind of brought everyone together. You know, yeah, of course, we should care about people's, um, you know, issues with race, gender, sexuality. Like there's a time and a place for that. And there is a time and a place for that in these fields. But like you said, like you that's not what you focus on. And I'm sure you have Mm -hmm. your own personal thoughts and beliefs and convictions when it comes to all that. But like you said, that's not why you're in the UFO world and why you're having these conversations. So I I, I get that. I get that. Um, Well, I have one more fun question to wrap things up here, Mick. Um, Let's see. Smiles Defy Gravity on Reddit asks, do you have any plans to make any more computer games or video games? And if so, I'd personally like to see him create a good UFO simulation game like Roswell, where you play the ET pilot who survives. Yeah, Any I think someone asked me on, uh, back your Tony on UCR. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what might be likely is I would do some kind of UFO scenario recreation software. I'm kind of interested in getting into virtual reality because I think a huge issue of of UFOs is this disconnect between seeing things on a two-dimensional screen and the actual reality of what people actually experience. <laughs> and if you can, instead of recreating an experience by drawing diagrams uh, and or even making a 3D simulation, if you can do it in virtual reality, uh, I think that would be super useful for people getting perspective on what actually happened. You, you go back to some of the, let's say the, the classic swamp gas um, thing mm. back from, uh, I believe it was Jay Alan, Alan Hynek uh, gave it, an explanation of a couple of sightings as being possibly swamp gas. And uh, part of that was because he kind of triangulated where this, this light was. And in one case, at least it was, it was over some swamp area. Uh, But you know, people took this more generally and they, 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 they thought it sounded ridiculous, but perhaps if you could actually recreate in virtual reality, what the people in that farmhouse saw and the people on the other side of the swamp, saw and then do things where you can kind of fly around uh, the entire scene uh, and view it in 3D, you might understand how it could possibly have been such a thing. Or you go back to, say, the Phoenix Lights. Uh, you got video of you know these, these lights over this ridge of mountains. Uh, perhaps if you could simulate the possible scenarios of like flares or you know, alien spaceships or secret technology sh- uh, ships, in some kind of virtual reality environments, you you might get a much better sense of of what people saw. Like people talk about a lot, like something flew overhead, and they say it was the size of a football field. When uh, it would be literally impossible for it to be the size of a football field based on on their actual description, because they're usually looking at something that's fairly uh, small angularly. But you, if you if you just got these verbal descriptions and you end up drawing diagrams of it, it's very hard. But I think if you had the virtual reality thing and you could recreate what they actually saw and get them involved in that, that would be a good way of of actually getting a much better model of what actually happened and helping them understand what they might have seen and helping other people understand what they might have seen. So if I do any uh, UFO-related programming, I think it's probably going to be UFO virtual reality recreations. Oh my god! I've, I've like electricity just surged through me. At the excitement of that—that that, that's genius. Like, talk about putting yourself in the shoes of a witness. Like, now you can have that yeah. that concept. Take the data, or take the, the testimony, or the cockpit exactly, and create recreate that scenario. Obviously, mm-hmm. it won't be perfect, but it's fun. And it's a way to try to yeah. understand it better. Do, you need yeah. to patent that right now. And I know you'll <laughs> raise millions to have that become a reality. Mm, I should crowdsource it. <laughs> Love Get, it. Uh... Love it. <laughs> well, Mick, this has been fascinating. You've been so gracious with your time, man. Um, we covered a lot. And I know um, there's a lot of questions we all still have of... Um, you know, all these videos that have come out and everything and where this whole UFO thing is heading. But I just want to thank you for the work you've done. I know you get a lot of, a lot of flack in the community. And again, 
I don't agree with everything you've come up with, but sure. neither do you agree with everything everyone else has come up with. But it's essential well, what you're doing. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think what what's really essential is trying to have the dialogue with people. Uh, like I said earlier, like if it's just like some guy making videos here and another guy making videos there, it's, it's always guys making these videos. Yeah. Um, it we'd get a lot we'd be a lot more productive if opposing positions would actually get together and discuss and that's that's what i think you know might be something that we should try to focus a little bit more on in the future rather than just going back and forth with uh dueling videos exactly well i mean i appreciate you having this discussion with me today and um last question of course where can we find everything you're up to uh your book and um yeah everything in between where can we find that well you can just go to twitter at mick west down there and uh uh that's pretty much will lead you to anything you want so you can go to mickwest.com and he has a long list of my other stuff as well and my, my book is called uh, escaping the rabbit hole if you want to uh, Try to talk to your friends who are stuck in conspiracy theories. This is uh, the book that tells you how to do it, or one of several books. Uh, uh, but, you know, you can just find me on, on Google. Mick West, there's not very many of us. Good, good, yeah. And I know a few friends and family who could probably uh, learn a lot from your book, so I'm going to definitely make sure they check that out. But, uh, Mick, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. Nice.